Want more of me? Oof. Who doesn't? Subscribe to the Volume YouTube channel today. All right, time to bring in my buddy Nick Wright. We don't like to bother him, he's a busy guy, but about every six weeks, we bring him on and I throw just a variety of topics his way. So first, before we get into anything, Nick had his top 50 players of the last 50 years in the NBA, and I gotta give him credit. I knew LeBron would be one, and I knew Jordan wouldn't be. But I grew up with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. In fact, when I was a kid in my driveway, that was who I mimicked. Bizarrely, not a guard. <laughs> I did the hook shot. And for people of Nick's generation, it's easy to forget how dominant Kareem was. He literally has the greatest, most unstoppable shot ever. He was all NBA defense like 15 times. So Nick, when you were doing this list, you knew Kareem would be up there. Yep. Was there ever a revelation? I'll tell you one yep. of the revelations I had with him. So years ago, I watched a, an HBO documentary, th I think on, on Lou Alcindor. And they showed video of his first year at UCLA. It was about a 12 second clip. Okay, UCLA, were, they were national champs. He played for the freshman team and they beat him by 40 in a scrimmage. <laughs> yep, <laughs> so, they were the best team in basketball and the freshman team beat him. So, so here's the thing on the cream thing because something very interesting has been being sent my way, which was one of my very first appearances on your show back in 2016. I did my top 20 ever at that point. And I had Kareem behind Michael, behind LeBron, I think also behind Magic. And people have said to me, oh, okay, so Kareem, I don't know if I had him behind Magic or not. In 2011, I did. I did it for a radio show. People were like, oh, Kareem, you know, scored a lot of points, did a lot in the last five years, huh, Nick? And the answer was no, I just hadn't done the research on it. I just was not, because here is the problem. There's a lot of light levels to why Kareem doesn't get the... I am not arguing Kareem's the greatest player ever. I am arguing the greatest player ever discussion should be three names. It has yeah. been... It, for some people, it has been one name forever, Jordan. For some people, they've opened it up just enough to say LeBron could be in it. I'm arguing Kareem is in the discussion. Yeah. So here's one of the things I didn't... I, I think one of the things that has hurt his you know, reputation amongst people my age or younger. They are old enough to remember him as a lesser version of himself. It's not like Wilt or Russell, who we never saw. I did see Kareem, but he was wearing goggles and he was scoring 17 points a game on Magic's team. So you, it's like when you think of Kareem, you're not thinking of Lou Alcindor, the Milwaukee Bucks, how dominant he was. I think you're thinking of kind of, you know, balding, gawky looking guy with goggles, and that's not who he was. And so the argument for Kareem is very simple. Take it out of basketball. Let's go to football and let's pretend Tom Brady didn't exist, okay? And it's like we're trying to figure out who the best quarterback ever is. It's between three guys. And I'm going to make the case for player A. Player A has, of the whole group, the most MVPs. He has thrown the most touchdowns. He has been to the most Super Bowls. And he's tied for the most Super Bowl wins. Would anyone argue, well, he's not in the discussion? Of course not. Kareem's got the most points, the most MVPs, the same rings as Jordan, the same finals appearances as LeBron. He's got to be in the discussion. And right. so once you agree that it's a three-person discussion, someone's got to come in third. And that's where the Jordan folks are going to get mad at me. But when it, we're talking about the greatest ever, every little bit matters. Jordan played far, far shorter than the other guys. You can argue he reached a higher peak if you want, but when he played really seven years less than Kareem or LeBron did, that has to matter because they played at high, LeBron is still playing at a high level. Kareem, we have been told, Colin, that Michael Jordan averaging 20 points a game for a shitty Wizards team at age 40 is a badge of honor. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar averaged 22 points a game in the NBA Finals at age 40. <laughs> so like the and so then we go to when they first walked into the league, Kareem was the best player. LeBron was finishing top 3 in MVP by year 2 and he was straight out of high school. And then it's also like, oh, okay, so like let's just what's the profile coming into the league? I don't know, like, you know, LeBron was the greatest prospect ever. 
Kareem was a franchise changer that took a 27-win team to 56 wins. Jordan took a 27-win team to 38 wins. They both had won 27 games before he got there. Uh, and Jordan was a really good college player who went third in the draft. Like, mm, that's interesting. Was Kareem ever going to go third in the draft? I don't think so. Was LeBron ever going to go third in the draft? I don't think so. So I just, listen, they're all unbelievable. I yeah. think Kareem has been, and one last point, I think the media, listen, the media barely covers outspoken black guys now fairly. How about we go 50 years ago and he's a converted Muslim? How do we think the average sports writer covered Kareem Abdul-Jabbar when he's battling John Havlicek? Probably not great. <laughs> I always thought it was this simple. I'll ask you a question. The biggest knock on Jordan is this. How many playoff series did he win without Scottie Pippen? Zero. He won one playoff game without okay. Scottie Pippen. Kareem and LeBron won multiple championships with other players. Jordan could not win without Pippen. And Michael, well, the by other the way, thing, because, the other it, thing because of his... Go ahead, sorry. Because of Michael's style, which you often saw, you saw it in Washington. You saw it in his first five years in Chicago. He did not play well with other scorers. He played well with Pippen, who acknowledged he would be in the passenger seat. LeBron won without Kyrie. He won without AD. He won without titles, without D. Wade. Kareem won in Milwaukee. Kareem won in Los Angeles multiple times. Like, there is value that Brady, we know Tom is wonderful. The idea that he can win a title with Bruce Arians with a different collection and a different culture absolutely establishes him as a notch above Elway, Manning, it's, it course, matters. Right, you mentioned Pippen. I always go to Phil Jackson. Jordan, of course, would have been a champion without Phil Jackson. I believe that. Right. But it is an element of Kareem won titles with three different head coaches. LeBron has won titles with three different head coaches and been to the finals with one, two, three, four, five different head coaches. Michael had Phil the whole time. And though again, if Michael had played longer than and played at that level, then I then maybe he's the guy. Uh, and he obviously is the guy for a lot of people. But the other thing is that people are like, why didn't Kareem win more in the 70s? And that's a fair knock. But what's also true is where I don't think people, because again, I'm an NBA nerd. And it wasn't until I did this project that I really drilled down on it. There are some weird things going on. All of a sudden, the NBA is like, hey, it's a best of three in round one. It's like a best of three. <laughs> there was one year Kareem's team had the second best record in their entire conference, and but they didn't get a bye because they didn't win their division, and now they're in a best of three against Moses Malone, and it's like, well, that sucks. You lost game one, you lost game three. Your season's over. It's like, we won 54 games. So I averaged 34 points a game in these three games. I'm out. The season's over. Yeah. I can't defend my title. Like So some weird stuff happened. And I just think, I think that my, the, my general, if people take anything away from this project, and you know how long I've been working on it because I was working on it with you a couple years ago. Um, yeah. I, I would like it to be at least when people talk about the greatest player ever, I don't care if they land on LeBron. I think it is LeBron. I think I think my kids will look at it unequivocally as LeBron. However, I want them to open the possibility that it's Kareem, that it should not be considered just a Michael versus LeBron thing, that Kareem should be included in it. Yeah, I mean, he Kareem was prickly and aloof, um, aesthetically not pleasing, especially the last ten years of his career. He was kind of a he was kind of a hook shot, and that was it. You know, he ran the floor early in his career very well. He did it at UCLA. He did yep. it in the first seven, eight years of his career. So, and I do think I do think optics matter, and relationships matter. And I mean, I've said this as we pivot to Aaron Rodgers. The media loves Aaron Rodgers because the media likes to be cool. The media thinks they're smarter than the average public. Studies show the media drinks more than the average public, and the, the media loves to be in on analytics regardless. Sam Hinkie was a disaster. The media lectured us for five years on Philadelphia being so analytically superior. 
and I think I've, I've said this about Aaron Rodgers, it's as if the media doesn't cover the playoff games where he completely melts down in huge fourth quarter situations the last two years. I know you were happy that you're, I don't know, are you pals with Big Cat? I don't know if you are. Yeah, I, I don't, like I don't know any like of those him. guys. No, I think they're super talented. I think you'd like them. Uh, I know, I'm sure you liked watching Big Cat just grill him over the playoffs saying well, I, he's what I, I did the think. dynasty of Rodgers' losses. No, it was. I thought it was very, very funny, and I think Aaron was a great sport, and those guys on that show are very talented guys. It is interesting, though, is that um, if you really look at what social media is, it's a race to tell everybody you're smarter than them. Aaron Rodgers has got into this weird space where, whether it's vaccines or um, a psychedelic drug, instead of, like, licensed professionals— Aaron is giving you this sense that, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of above this and smart people seek their own opinions. They don't follow others. I tend to follow licensed professionals. And I think when you combine the anti-vax stance and the fibbing on it, and you combine it with the psychedelic drug usage, that, that T, it does to me, um, it, this is what happens when you get older richer and single. You become incredibly self-indulgent. You really believe you have all the answers. And I think I think some of the strangest behavior in sports, Kevin Durant, Kyrie, Aaron Rodgers, rich, older, single, don't sacrifice for kids, not married, go home on your device. You start believing listen, wealth makes people think they're impenetrable. And I think Aaron's gotten strange. So here's my question about that, because I, I think your single, the, the single component's a really interesting one that I hadn't thought of. But it, what it reminded me of is Hollywood. And, and by that I mean, listen, you live in LA, and I don't, listen, I'm not, I'm not casting aspersions for anyone's beliefs, uh, but I've never met in my day-to-day -day life a Scientologist. Maybe in LA you've come across a few, I don't know. I've never met someone, it's like, hey, what's your belief? They're like, I'm a Scientologist. But it would appear that, I don't know, 10% of the upper, upper crust of Hollywood is. And that to me is, I mean, a similar, it's not the same as what we're talking about with Aaron, but it's it's on the same tree of like, you know, I'm, I, I have evolved past what is contemporary thinking and I'm yes. on an elevated plane. Yes. And I, so the point I'm making is, I, I think some of this is how people respond to overwhelming fame. So I think like sometimes guys or people, you know, lean into drugs. With athletes, that's tougher because your body's so important, right? So then what do you do with this overwhelming fame? And I think in, in Hollywood, we see a lot of, like none of the stuff Aaron's doing would be considered that odd at all if you were a movie star, right? right. Do you agree? It would be yeah. considered really, in fact, of the movie stars, like, you know, Will Smith and Tom Cruise at different times were the biggest movie stars in the world. All of this would be very tame from what, you know what I mean, I've read their different belief structures are, right? So I do wonder if Aaron almost crossed over through the Jeopardy and through the different circles he ran in from s amazing football player to super famous guy who's great at football. And in that world, he, like it's, it, I, I'm trying to find the right analogy, but there are, it's just in different circles, different things become acceptable. So, you know, I, in, I spend a lot of time in the poker community, right? And the, right. The, in that world, what guys are willing to gamble high stakes of money on in any other world people would look at it if they'd be like oh my god you have a crippling gambling problem need to go you know what i mean right. need to go see someone but within that world it's totally normalized it, and, and it, it's just like that is just how people act right so if you're running in a circle of oh it's totally normal for you to not see tr a traditional doctor and totally normal for you to try to have these awakenings. It, your barrier for injury becomes so much shorter, or so much lower. Yes. Meanwhile, if, if, I, if you called me and you were like, Nick, next time the herd's off, 
I'm flying to Peru doing ayahuasca. I'd be like, Colin, are you okay? Like, really? This is what you're doing? But if you called me and I was like, dude, did it two months ago. It's fucking awesome. Like, and then all of a sudden it gives you, you feel much more comfortable. So if you're around people that have done this, you know what I mean? That that's their, so that's what I think. That's the Aaron thing. And I think the, I haven't thought enough about the lack of a spouse and how much that, and maybe that is, maybe the spouse that isn't as famous, you know what I mean? Brings you down to a degree. You know what I mean? Makes you, uh, I can't think of the word, but normalizes you to a degree. And so maybe that's an element of it. But I think it's very clear that Aaron is a different type of cat than we're used to with any pro athlete that I can remember of his stature. Yeah. No, I think what women do is they hold you accountable. I, I, I said this the other day on the air, you know, half serious. Kevin Durant married, goes to his wife. I'm going to leave Steph Curry, Steve Kerr, Bob Myers, the best culture in the league, best team for Kyrie Irving and that mess in Brooklyn. A wife would say, hell, you are. Go by yourself. Go have lunch with Draymond. Figure it out. That's what my wife would do. If, I, if, if, um, if Kyrie Irving was married and he said, I'm not going to get the vax, his wife would say, get to a damn pharmacy. You, this is a team. I mean, get it for our kids. What, what are you doing? But again, rich, single, on your phone, on your device, very self-indulgent. And it's not really a criticism. It's a reality. Bill Simmons talked about this. You get rich and you get older. I could point to two people in the media I know who have now reached like late 50s, early 60s, never married, no kids, no pets. They're odd. They've taken weird turns over the last 10 years. I think you know at least one I'm talking about. I know one of about. them. I know one of them. I'd argue that guy was odd forever. But, <laughs> but regardless, he's gotten odder. Um, that's for sure. So, yeah. No, that, that's a really, you know, I think that's a smart point, which is, and, and I think the other thing is, and now I'm just really it, 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 wild speculation here, but the other thing is that comes with not just marriage and it, with marriage and kids is you have so much less time that you just don't have as much opportunity to fall down rabbit holes and to get into bullshit, even if you want to. Like, I don't know what you did this Sunday. I'll tell you what I did. Drove three hours to upstate New York to drop my girls off at camp and then drove three hours back. Now, on the way back, did I stop by a casino? I did, because you still find some time to get into some shit. <laughs> However, that's still, that's eight hours of my day just gone. If I don't have them, do I spend those eight hours? I'm like, do I wake up in the morning? I'm like, yeah, let me see what's going on on Twitter. And all of a sudden, is it four hours of YouTube videos later where I, where I, all of a sudden I have very interesting opinions I didn't hold previously? Maybe. You just are so much. And when you're, when, you know, for KD, you know, he's made it very clear. And I give him credit for the transparency on it. He wants to, you know, hoop. And he clearly works incredibly hard at his craft. But there's only so much basketball you can play in a day. That's right. He's not a weight room guy. So, and he, so the, what's the rest of his day? Playing video games, hanging out, smoking some weed, screwing around on the internet. And it that all of a sudden, even if you're playing basketball six hours a day, playing basketball six hours a day, sleeping eight, you got another 10 to just, you know what I mean? To just That's right. do whatever. And it, it is just, it's a very different world when you're busy all the time with things that aren't your own stuff. Also, um, kids keep you real. Let's, let's now segue to the Patriots. And I think Greg Popovich has fallen into this, and Belichick has. When you're really successful, success warps even the smartest people. Um, I mean, to listen to Nick Saban complain about the NIL because it'll hurt um, – parody in the sport yeah. is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. He's lost his, his mind on that, right? Because you start to think empirically your opinion is just right because you're beating people. You're smarter than people. You continue to dominate people. I am better than people. And that's why it's important to have people in your life that push back. Um, I think Popovich and Belichick have now bought into their system more than they have the reality of their sport, which is in the NFL, we used to think it was a 50-50 proposition. Star quarterback coach, Brady Belichick. 
it now appears to be about a 70-30 proposition. Like, we know Andy Reid is brilliant. But you're going to lose in the first round, and then you get Mahomes, right. and you're dominant. Right? Yep. So, so Belichick now is using a special teams coach, a defensive coordinator, and a cornerbacks coach to coach his offense. And I think like Popovich, success has given him a belief, and success does this to a lot of people I've met, is that he's so powerful, so wealthy, his legacy is set that nobody will go, Bill, you've lost your mind. In an era with a second-year quarterback, in, a, in an offensive pivoting league, he's using a defensive coordinator to call plays. It's insane. So, so, of course, it's insane. So, here's my question. Is it that... My question on this is, because I think there was a turning point in the Patriots season last year. I think it's very clear. It was that stupid Buffalo windstorm. Hit. They won it. They won it. It was Belichick, to me, doing something very odd that seemed to be against... Anything I had seen him do in his career. He was always about winning this week. Not, you know, we're on to Cincinnati, not worried about anything else. And it felt like that game, he wanted to win, but what he really wanted to do was win a certain way as a giant middle finger to everyone who thought he lost his fastball. I'm going to show you that in 2021, I can win a football game without throwing a pass. And they threw three, and one of them seemed like Mac Jones audibled into. And the reason I say that was the pivot point is, Mac was a different player after that. They, they went one and four the rest of the way. Mac had one decent game was against the Jaguars. Every other game they lost by double by multiple scores by an average of 15 points. And it seemed like that messed with his confidence. But it seemed like Belichick was trying to, after Brady had won a Super Bowl and done all this stuff, remind everyone, I'm the smartest guy out there. Does it feel at all to you like he's doing something similar right here? Like, oh... You think I needed Josh McDaniels? Well, how about I don't replace him? And how about what would I bring in are two guys who used to work for me, then they left, they failed. They were defense and special teams, and I'm going to win with them. And I don't think it's going to work. I think this is about like proving a point to the world that the part of it that I don't get is he doesn't need to prove it. No one argues about who the greatest coach ever is. With respect to Bill Parcells and Vince Lombardi and Walsh, everyone just says Belichick. So I don't know what he, what the chip on the shoulder, where it comes from, but it seems like he's, at this point, cutting off his nose despite his face. Let me, I always think, I like to be able to see around corners. You know, be like six months ahead of yeah. a story. Like, this is going to happen. It's fun for me, right? And so there's never been a great movie with a bad ending. There isn't any. Okay. It doesn't exist. There is no great novel with a lousy final chapter. So I've said this. If Andy Reid can sustain his health and coaches for seven to eight more years and Belichick never gets over the turbulence, the leak clearly pivots the offense and Andy Reid wins two to three Super Bowls with Mahomes, the argument for best football coach ever, is going to feel a lot like LeBron and Michael, is that Andy Reid got to Super Bowls, um, multiple Donovan quarterbacks. Yeah. He won in the AFC. He won in the NFC. He won with different owners. Belichick fired, didn't work, got Brady. Brady left, didn't work. Is that as the league moves to offense, if Andy coaches for eight years, he's going to have eight really good years. Just three Super Bowls. That'll give him four. We are going to look at that greatest coach ever argument. Andy is the single coach who's always given Belichick. We'll go to head-to-head -head meetings. Yep. You know he's already got his number. What happens if he goes 4-0 and the next eight years against him? 3-0. and You think I'm nuts on that? No, well... I think that it's hard to square with the fact that I'm pretty sure you're going to pick the Chiefs to miss the playoffs this year. I'm not certain if you've done that yet, but I would, I mean, so I'm not certain, but, uh, but I don't think you're nuts. Um, here's what I think. I think Belichick is obviously m miles ahead in the race. Right. I think Bill needs to make the race unwinnable for any other current coach one more good playoff run. I don't think he needs to win a Super Bowl. I think, though, if he were to 
make the AFC Championship game in the next four years, I think that is that's enough to make it to where he is yep. two laps ahead of the field. And impenetrable. Even if Andy does impenetrable because I don't think Mac Jones is that good. I think Mac Jones is fine. I think he is. A, I think his ceiling is Ryan Tannehill. I think it's like, hey, can you be that guy? And I think everyone knew that. And, you know, my buddy Kevin Wilds on the show gets so mad. He's like, why do you pick all these second-year quarterbacks to take a leap and not Mac Jones? And it's because the same reason he went 15th in the draft, because everyone knew he was the most pro-ready, but also thought he had the smallest room for improvement. And I don't like anything the Patriots have done, but set that aside. If he can get to a conference championship game in this conference, with Josh Allen and Mahomes and Herbert and Burrow and Lamar yeah. and all that, that would be like the ultimate mic drop moment. But the flip side of that is Belichick coaches four more years and doesn't make the playoffs. Then it's one of those where I don't believe in legacies going backwards, but it certainly hurts because of what Brady's done. And because they, like, to, if, if, if he keeps going and the team and it seems like the game has passed him by, yep. that's not going to be great. I, again, I'd love to speak it into existence for Andy, and you know I'm not a count the rings guy, so I don't think Andy. Oh, uh, Andy's got to win six rings to be the greatest coach ever. Uh, but your point on Andy going to four straight NFC Championship games with Donovan McNabb, and then going hosting four straight with Patrick Mahomes is pretty damn impressive. Is, and one other thing, as great as Mahomes is, and you obviously know how great I think he is, it's not like Mahomes' profile coming out of college was Peyton Manning. It's not like people are like, oh, suck for luck. The Oh, the Chiefs won the lottery. He was the third quarterback taken in his own draft, second, third quarterback taken in his own draft. You know what I mean? He was the 10th pick. And so it's not like when he got there, people are like, oh, dynasty now locked in. Nobody thought that. And then, except for the people who were practicing with him, we were comparing him to Brett Favre after a month. And so, yeah, that is interesting. I like the take. I do wonder, you said it, and you said it kindly. I wonder how much longer Andy's going to coach. Uh, you said if his health holds up. Like, I, you know, he's had some tough personal tragedies, obviously. But if he, he's, I would imagine he's having more fun now than he's ever had in his career. And unlike Belichick, he hasn't dealt with this, this coaching staff turnover. That's the big thing that he helps the Chiefs this year. Josh Allen lost Brian Dable. You know what I mean? The Patriots, who I don't think are a contender, though, they lost people. Uh, we've talked about the Broncos are going to be this great team. It's a new head coach. We'll see if he's any good. A lot of the, the Ravens lost their defensive coordinator. No one will hire poor Eric Bieniemy. So, and it's, it's, so the Chiefs just keep their coordinators every year, which that right. continuity is super helpful. Um, hold on. I saw this. Go ahead. You bet your son... Ten thousand oh, dollars. Well, that's a little misleading. Yeah. Hold on. Up. That he could get to five hundred thousand Twitter followers before. Backwards. That he could get to five thousand before I got to five hundred thousand. What's that like as a dad? That that was that the worst bet of your life? You lost ten thousand dollars. The moment I, I I so here's let me set it up. So he was at like thirty five hundred, and I was at four hundred ninety five thousand. And I was like, do you think you're going to get to 5000 before I get to 500000 And he's like, oh, yeah. And I was just doing the math in my head. I'm like, it's taking you. You need to add 50. You're at 3600 You need to add 1300 You need to add 50% more to what you have. Right. I need to add 1% more to what I have. This is a dumb bet by you, buddy. He's like, no. I was like, I'll give you 10 to 1. I was like, you pick the amount. And I thought he was going to pick like 100 bucks, 200 bucks. But he's got this new good gig with Fox. He's finally making actual money. He's saving money. So he's like, I'll bet $1,000. It's like, you're going to bet $1,000. And the moment he said it with such confidence, I was like, I think I screwed up here. And then my own podcast worked against me because they put out that clip. And, there's, and all of a sudden, my followers were going down. The people were unfollowing me to follow him <laughs> to make sure... I mean, he got there in 16 hours. I mean, I, <laughs> this is two weeks ago. I'm at five, I'm still at 495,000. Like I'm still trying to get back to where I was. It was a, listen, it was a poor wager. However, I'm gonna say this in case he's listening. 
However, there was an element of... I'm not saying I'm free, I was free-rolling him. However, here in the next few months, he's going to move to Los Angeles. It's his plan. And while he does have a good job and he has been saving money, my guess is for him to successfully move to Los Angeles, I'm probably going to have to help a little bit. So I figured that 10000 was going his way. It's one time or another. Might as well free roll him in this bet. If he wins, he feels great. If he loses, it's a lesson. Don't gamble. I, you know, do as your father says, not as he does. Uh, in other news, what, what do you want to rent out your pool house? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, what's funny about Los Angeles is my daughter lives in West Hollywood, and it's egregiously expensive. Um, it's a really good apartment town, though. That's what I'll say about it. It's, an, it's a tremendous apartment town, all over town, and they're competitive. You have to be semi-competitive because, you know, these people, they need tenants. Yeah. But the thing about Los Angeles is, is that... Um, the economy is dynamic. So we're usually the last into a recession and the first out. Um, but between the tax rate and how long you're in your car with gas prices, you know, my daughter's like, Dad, I'm not really a spender. I'm just in my car a lot. Like there's a lot of cities. Yeah. Chicago's one. You can live downtown and work downtown. There's a lot of cities. New York, live downtown, work downtown. Philadelphia. It's not really Los Angeles. So what your son's going to find out is um, gas. You know how in most cities you're like transportation and rent is 70% of your monthly. Throw in, throw in gas, you'll be eating Chick-fil-A for dinner four nights yeah, a week. Oh, yeah. No, the, no the, right. That's the thing. However, it's the, here's the other thing, and this is my, like, what I would say to, not that I'm, I, I try not to give parenting advice, but I'm in a unique position because I've, I'm very young to have raised kids as old as I've raised. And everyone, there is, it, 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 no matter what your own financial situation is, I think the single best thing to do for your kids is post college let them go through the, while you're there as a true safety net, if things really go sideways. But you know how someone figures out, how do I get my power turned back on? Having that shit turned off and realizing, I gotta figure this out in the next eight hours, or I gotta get power. How do I register a car? You know how you figure, the only way you actually learn how to do that, once you get about your third ticket for not having your car registered and you say, I have to get a registered or they're going to tow it away. And so for for my kid, he wasn't living with me during the pandemic. And he was out in Kansas City where, you know, we're from, living on his own, working on his own, figuring everything out. And in those 15 months that he was there, it was it was like he aged in a positive way 8 years. You know what yep. I mean? It was like when it because he was on his own every day, just figured like, I've got to figure things out. And then once you do that, I feel like you as a person have a different confidence about yourself where you're like, you yeah. know what? I can't, if you said eat Chick-fil-A, it got, you know what? If it comes to it, I can eat ramen every night and I'll be okay. I can find a place I can live. I can sleep on a couch for a month while I figure it out and I'll be okay. You've got to go through that in order to know you can go through that. And once you yeah. do that, you're, to me, a lot more fearless. You're like, oh, I'll go try this, I'll go do that, whatever it is. I think it's a great, so I, the, the point there is, even if you have millions and millions of dollars, I think, I think you should, and you plan to give it to your kids one day. I think you shouldn't right when they get out of school, or I think they should go through a period of figuring that shit out a little bit on their own, and they will feel better about it. Yeah, I mean, the one thing my ex and I strongly agree on is travel. We want our kids to have to go through airports by themselves. We sent our daughter to Cape Town, South Africa by herself. I remember that. That was a couple years ago, right? Yep. Yeah. And learn to travel. And um, it's, been, it's been great. Put our kids on planes. By the time they're 15, 16, figure it out. And, you know, I don't know if I'm a good parent, but... The one thing I learned in my life, first job out of college, 
I went to Vegas by myself and made a lot of mistakes. But I'm going to tell you something. It toughened my skin. And by the time I got to ESPN in my late 30s, I saw a lot of these Connecticut kids who had never been west of Denver. And they had always traveled with their parents. And they grew up in Philadelphia. And they worked at ESPN. It was the only job they'd ever had. And I could feel it. I was much more resilient to bad management, bad decisions, bad days, bad segments, that I think all I know about parenting is put your kids while you're alive in really challenging situations, and they grow a little bit of a force field. They, they, they are empowered. That's about all I know about, because I've seen it now with all of my kids. Well, they're empowered, and... It, listen, I, I am speaking from like a, you know an obvious like place of privilege. It obviously is good to know if sh- if things do really go sideways, you are there to help them and you will That's pick right. them up. Um, but I just I I look so I had a similar I, I you know after college I went to Kansas City, which is where I'm from. But I didn't you know my mom didn't live there anymore, and I my dad in I have a great relationship, but it was never even on the board that I was going to go live with him. I just it's like I'm gonna find a terrible apartment with a friend from high school, and we're gonna to live together while you know what I mean. While I try to figure out this radio thing, and that experience, I still draw on it. I yeah. still to this day draw on it, and I think back to my some of my closest friends that I went to high school with that graduated when I did, that after college, really just kind of floated for like four or five years, like went to one version of graduate school and they, that's a big thing amongst people my age was getting graduate degrees that I don't think they wanted, but they knew as long as they were in school, their parents bankrolled everything. And so they, 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 it was a big thing of like, I have so many friends that started out in law school and then briefly went to medical school. I'm like, you're 27. You've been in school your whole life and you have the same degrees I have because you just keep leaving, which is just the under, like, so I think there's, a, there's an element of just going out to figure stuff out. And I think people can figure out a hell of a lot more than they think they can when they go do it. Yeah. My daughter says she wants to get a master's. And I said to her, a master's in what? And then she kind of smiled. And I thought, yeah, you just want two more years of that yeah. Visa card. Exactly. <laughs> I, listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I wasn't trying to, I didn't know that was the case. With your daughter. I'm not trying to down talk your daughter at all. And by the way, it's not a bad gig. The Colin Cowherd Visa card's a great Visa card. <laughs> Pretty high limit. I don't blame her. Live in LA, go to USC or UC or go to USC. Yeah, I mean, do it. I, I, I get it. But the, the, I, that is a, I think that is a thing of I could start life or I could continue this whole like I'm old enough to where no one can tell me what to do, but I'm young enough to where no one judges me for spending other people's money. Let's ride that train as long as I can. It's not a bad gig. It's not a bad gig if you can get it. That's right. What are you, you, you going to get your master's in? Philosophy. I don't like to think. <laughs> Yeah, my, she to told me about. what she was thinking about her ma- getting her master's in, and it was environmental psychology. And I'm like, so you'll talk to trees? <laughs> That's got to not be what it is. You have to be misrepresenting what environmental psychology is. It can't I'll, be the psychology of the environment. I think you're simplifying it wrong. I was. I was simplifying it to win the argument. But I said, <laughs> I ain't paying for you to talk to shrubs. So you got to find a different one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's unbelievable. Dad, All right. I've thought long and hard about this. I need to get a master's. What's it going to be? Yeah. Art history. I just, I really think that. <laughs> I really think that's what the career is going to be. Really, what are you going to do? Well, after school, I really think the only way to really take advantage of the degree is to tour Europe. I mean, to see the art history in real time. I mean, you keep that going to your 27. I like it. I like that idea. Nick Wright, as always, buddy. Money. You're the best. Uh, by the way, speaking of travel, I have to tell you real quick before I go. Uh, Friday, I, I go to Italy. So it didn't, like, and I, you're a... Oh. Florence I, is the great walking city. I thought Siena was the prettiest city. Um, the coast, we didn't get to. Rome is a big city, wildly frenetic, hot and crowded, but I loved it. 
and um, the people are wonderful. They live longer than us, despite the fact they smoke, do smoke not work drink. out. Yeah. But what greatest. you know, what's interesting about drinking? Italian women do not like their men to drink. Very interesting. Well, no, a glass of wine with dinner. I was told this by two different friends in Italy. It is looked down upon. The Americans go to Italy to drink. Italians don't drink as much as you think. They're very proud of their wine. They're not partiers. They live a great life. They walk more than us. They enjoy life more. They sleep more. They smoke more. They exercise less, but they live longer. But I think there's this fable, this belief, this mythology. Oh, the Italians are all drunk, stumbling down. Never saw one example in eight days in Italy. Did not see a single Italian drunk. They have a glass of wine, but they love to be together. I saw, now they drink espressos way later into the evening than Americans do. Like, we cut it off at 4, right? It's like, you can't have an espresso. Uh, It's 10 o'clock at night. It's a smoke. It's an espresso. But I think there is a mythology about the the, the amount of partying and drinking. It's just, I did not see it in eight days. Well, I can't wait. I'm Italian. I'm half Italian. I've been once when I was a teen visiting my sister who was studying abroad. I was there for two days, so that doesn't even count. You know, so I've basically never been there. And this will, you'll love this. I am taking to Rome and then elsewhere, but Rome's the, where we're landing. My wife, my wife's best friend, who is uh, the lady I told you about that's a huge fan of yours. Yeah. Uh, my mom and my wife's grandparents who are 92 and 89, who we are the people we took to Barcelona with us two years ago. So all, so all six of us are doing Italy on Friday for 10 days. And I can't you, wait. Oh, it'll I be. I can't wait. You're going to have so much fun. Oh, it's going to be. I already, Colin, this is for your, if people are, people are watching on YouTube. I, this is my, this is everything I have planned. I'm such a nerd. I wrote it all down, all every, everywhere I want to eat, everything I want to see, all my, all the things I have planned, it all. I got it all ready to go. I can't wait. It's going to be so fucking great, bro. It's going to be great. I'm like- going to call you from there. I might call, you know what? I might call into the herd if you do call-ins half in the bag. You're saying I'm not supposed to drink while well, I'm in Italy. I'm going to be drinking in Italy, buddy. I'll tell you that much. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> the Americans do. The Italians Thank don't. You. Good to see you. Thank you for having me on. I'll see you, buddy.